All right, welcome back to the Flow Track On The Run podcast. I'm JoJo. And I'm Kevin. And we've just wrapped up a busy conference championship weekend. Looking ahead a little bit to the prelims because the entries just came out for the East and West prelims, which, by the way, you can watch live on Flow Track during Memorial Day weekend. That'll be a lot of fun. Um, Great way to spend a three-day weekend. Yeah. (laughs) And, I mean, you'll be out at the West prelim. Mm -hmm. I will be in Sacramento for the West prelim. Just got back from Big Tens. You got back from... Big, Big 12. 12s. How was it out there? I was so immersed in Big 10. Yeah, 12. it was really hot. I mean, it's <laughs> Texas, so I don't know. If you haven't been to Texas, it's full-on summer mm-hmm. in May. It's, it was 90, over 90 degrees every day, you know, at 5 o'clock. Uh, the 10K night was actually really nice. It was mm-hmm. 83 and breezy. But, of course, the Iowa State kids were warming up with ice fests on. Wow. <laughs> but to anyone who lives in Texas, it actually felt pretty nice that night. Um, yeah, it was hot and, you know, some of the, the action, <coughs> excuse me, the action was pretty hot too. Uh, Divine Oduduru of Texas Tech, I feel like he was one of the biggest stars of the mm-hmm. weekend over there, sweeping the one and the two and, uh, you know, he's making a, making a go at winning his first national title coming up. And I also saw that women's steeple race, which was one of the craziest last 50 meters of a steeple I've ever yeah. seen. It <laughs> did not look real there. Um, Oklahoma catching their West Virginia off the last barrier. I mean, it was wild. Yeah, watch. it was pretty wild. I wasn't even – I was Googling the West Virginia girls' stats, so I actually totally missed when she got past. You thought <laughs> I was it was like, over. Oh. <laughs> yeah, she had a huge lead. I mean, at that point in the race, you know, and she didn't lose any momentum mm-hmm. off the, the final water jump. Just uh, Sarah Scott, way to close. And her first sub-10. Yeah. Which is always a big accomplishment for like she, chaser. Yeah, it looked like she was just shot out of a cannon the last 50. Yeah. Like, it looked like she, she saw it. She <laughs> saw it was within grasp. Yeah, but it was like a block start almost. Yeah. She just flew out of there. It was pretty cool well, to see. Amy Cashin from West Virginia, I believe that's her third straight runner-up finish at Big 12s. So. Oh, really? So well, it's just consistent. Yeah, but in the most dr- dramatic way. Any surprises people – that, that jumped out at you that exceeded expectations or people who didn't perform as well as you thought or maybe didn't perform at all? Yeah, no, there are a couple um, nice surprises. Uh, Kiana Horton from Baylor, she, you know, had been running maybe like high 52s for most of her season, and she came in and ran like a 51-4 mm-hmm. uh, to set the school record and win her first Big 12 title, so that was really exciting in the women's 400. Um, I mean, in the Big 12 women's 400, you know, we've had Courtney Okolo, Chris Ann Gordon, a lot of the women who win that conference championship are big contenders for NCAA. So it was cool to see a new face. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in the men's 400 hurdles, Texas Tech redshirt freshman Norman Grimes made a huge breakthrough. He'd never broken 50 seconds before. Uh, he ran 49-4 to win his first Big 12 title. Uh, after what was a pretty rough freshman year. Uh, he had a, a broken bone in his foot, I believe, and just had to start completely from scratch, and now he's a top-five ranked athlete in the nation. Mm-hmm. What about uh, Big Tens? What were some surprises there? Isaiah Harris won, which wasn't a surprise, but he ran 145, which is a really good sign, and afterwards he said training is indicating he's you know can get to a PR this year. Like They've backed up some of the speed, like they focus more on strength early in the season. So he feels real confident of continuing to drop the time. It was it was fun to watch him run because he was led out by two Indiana runners, Cooper Williams and, and Daniel Coons. It was almost like he had a rabbit. And there was no question Harris was going to run, but it was very hot, hot in Bloomington too. And he had run rounds a couple of days before. He had the 4 by 4 later. He just didn't know how fast he was going to go. So anytime someone pops a 145 at conference is, is pretty pretty impressive given the workload and the point of the season. Aaron Finn, I think everybody's seen that race by now. Yeah, that went viral. <laughs> or if they haven't, uh, check it out on the site. The women's 10,000 from the first evening of competition on, on Friday night. I mean, one of the most surreal races I've ever seen. A little bit shades of, of Julia Lucas and that Olympic trials race where she got made the big move with 1,200 to go and then she got caught. But this, in a way, was a lot more different than that because Finn was going to win and it and her signs of distress were much more pronounced. Like her head was flying back and almost like her eyes were closing. She was running off. The, I mean, ran herself, as Ryan Fenton, my broadcast partner, said, literally ran herself into the ground. She collapsed as soon as she crossed the finish line. 
And to go out at 15.52 for the first 5K, after that, that race had been delayed 90 minutes because of heat, both the 10,000s, oh, they wow. pushed them later. So that it's not like people didn't know that it was you know, bad conditions or it was like deceptively hot. It was, it was clear to everybody there, but she wanted to run that hard. And receiver, Catherine Receiver went with her for a while. And Catherine Receiver is, you know, she's running her first 10,000, but a great runner, accomplished runner. And Finn left her after a mile and a half, maybe two miles, and then was just completely on her own. I mean, you lap the entire field except for one runner. It's, it's pretty phenomenal. Um, so what'd she say after the race? After the race, Nothing, because she had to get medical attention. The next day when we caught up with her, she actually said the only other time she had run to that point of distress was on that same track, actually. I think when they had U.S. juniors in, oh. Indi- in Bloomington a couple years back. And she said she wanted to run that hard. She just didn't know that it obviously was going to lead. She wanted a hard effort, and she didn't know it was going to lead necessarily you know, to that outcome. That was her 10th Big Ten title and her last go around so I think she wanted to, to leave your stamp on it and it, she didn't have a 10,000 this year so I guess she needed a, a a qualifying time too if she wanted to run at USA's and she just said her mind at a point her mind and her body weren't communicating so she like hadn't her head was go as people saw the video she called herself the human Pez dispenser which I thought was a very <laughs> el- eloquent way to put it like her head kept creeping up and she just said her, her body had no control like over that motion at all at a certain point and then she got when they took her back to the hotel they got her in a like you know cooled down and got her Gatorade and everything and then she was fine and was in good spirits the next day but it was it was scary there for a while in recent months we've seen like Callum Hawkins in the marathon completely mm, yeah you know fall that's apart. a good comparison yeah and and there was another woman in some marathon in Europe there was a Kenyan woman who was leading you know by a large margin and then you know she started staggering she never went you know she never went down she just kind of stepped off the track and then bounced back. But it was a totally different type of, I, I guess, um, physical manist- manifestation of, of the symptoms for Finn. But, I mean, just the, the tenacity to go after it in that weather and to run yourself to that level was, was like, I'd never seen anything like that, in, especially in person. Um, it was, because she didn't need to, you know, at a certain point. She had no idea. Right. She had no idea how big of a lead she had. Like, with two miles to go, she could have, just completely shut it down and could have coasted to victory. But I wonder how tough that'll be to recover from. Yeah. I mean, she's got to run another 10K before she even gets to nationals. Right. And I guess we'll talk to talk about prelims more after after our interview. But, uh, yeah, that's one of the things I'm interested in to see um, coming out of the – that'll be the East prelim, I guess. But, yeah, those were those were two of the highlights. I mean, we'll, we'll see Williams of, of Purdue ran 10-10, win legal – in the 100, which was fun. David Kinzera didn't race the final of the highs or the low hurdles, and it was favored in both. So a question mark there heading into into uh, the prelim meet. Right. And and outside of Big 10 and Big 12, of course, biggest storyline, Sydney McLaughlin, 52-75. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> Collegiate record, the LSU women uh, getting their, their claws uh, – Free of Oregon from that yeah. four by one record. I know that's something they've been wanting to do all season. Mm-hmm. Um, so pretty exciting stuff coming out of the the SEC championship as well. Yeah, for sure. I mean, what more can you say about Sydney and also ACC championships? Which brings us yeah do you want to introduce to our guest. Our guest uh, today, we're going to talk to Virginia Tech junior junior Rachel Pokratsky, who doubled and won both the eight hundred and the fifteen hundred. At ACC's this weekend, she's now the NCAA leader in the 15, 410-03. So close to that, uh, breaking that 410 barrier, she'd be the first woman to do so this season. Um, she's made one NCAA final in her career, this indoor season. She was sixth in the 800. Uh, so really curious to talk to her about her progression and you know whether she sees herself as an 800 or a 1500 runner after this weekend. For sure. And like we said, after we talk with Rachel we'll come back and dig a little bit into the the prelim rankings Jojo you wrote an article pulling out some of the best stuff some of the most intriguing storylines coming out with that but first things first let's go to our interview with Rachel and we're joined now by Rachel Prokratsky from Virginia Tech welcome to the show thank you uh congrats on your big weekend has it is it still sinking in yeah, definitely. I've been getting a lot of congrats from friends and family from all over all over the place that I haven't really heard from in a while, actually, and so it's pretty cool. 
Can you walk us through the weekend? Well, I started with my 1500 prelim on Thursday, and then I had my 800 prelim on Friday, and then I had my 1500 prelim earlier in the day on Saturday, and then an hour and a half later, I had my 800 final um, as well. <laughs> so it was pretty busy. Yeah. And I mean, I wasn't able to watch the race, but I noticed you won the 1500 final by like four seconds. Can you kind of take yeah. us through how that race played out? Yeah. So basically, um, I got out pretty fast and basically led the whole first lap or I guess three fourths of the lap until about the finish line area. And then Jessica Harris, she kind of took over for the next two laps or so and kept a really steady pace. And then I just started kicking around the last lap and just kind of took over and held it and was kind of just hoping that no one else would catch me. <laughs> How did it feel to see 410 on the board? Oh, my gosh. It was really crazy. I was not expecting something that fast, especially when I was doubling and after running two other races previously. So it was pretty cool. <laughs> and then they told me that it was the national leading time, and I was very excited to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> was it tougher to run the 1500 race or the 800 race? Um. The 1500 was definitely challenging, but honestly, it was actually kind of nice that Jessica had kind of taken the lead, and I'm really glad she did because it kind of helped me pace it better than I probably would have if I had just gone out and done it. Um, but the 800 was just fast, and I was already um, in – I had already run one other race, so I was pretty tired, so I wasn't sure exactly how it was going to go. So that one was definitely a lot more challenging, I would say. <laughs> To run. Does being the national leader um, in the 15 make you think any differently about yourself or your abilities moving forward? Uh, not really. I mean, I think it definitely kind of puts more of a spotlight on me and kind of draws people's attention to me, good or bad, unfortunately, but going into regionals and nationals. But I mean, I think it's also just shows what I'm capable of doing and it makes me kind of excited to see what else I can do. Do you have a preference between the events? I mean, you've shown success at both. Mm -hmm. Um, I honestly haven't really raced the 15 enough to know it that well, but based on what I have done in it, I really like it and enjoy it. But the eight has always been my, um, events since high school that I've always liked and known how to run pretty well. So that one's probably still my favorite, but the 15 is definitely growing on me. <laughs> when, so did you make the transition fully to the 15 just, just in college? You only ran 800s in, in high school? Yeah, for the most part. I ran maybe two miles my senior year of high school, and they, they were not fast times at all, but... Um, yeah, I slowly started transitioning in college. I was more of a four, eight person in high school. Did you think that that would be inevitable that you would move up in distance or did your coach sort of surprise you and be like, Hey, guess what, Rachel, you're going to be more of a miler now. <laughs> no, I, I kind of figured it was probably going to happen. I figured I'd at least be an 800, 1500 runner instead of a four, eight person, um, my coaches in high school had kind of warned me about that, that it's usually pretty common for coaches to move girls up to slightly longer distances. And I definitely had like the build and ability to run a 15. I just hadn't really done it before. So I kind of figured it was going to happen. Can you tell me like your mindset and how you approach an eight and how it's similar or different than how you'd approach a 1500? Okay. Um, well, in 800, you, it's a much shorter race, definitely. So you have to be able to react much faster and kind of look for openings in gaps or sorry, when you're 
like boxed in possibly or around a bunch of other girls. You just have to be able to get out of there a lot quicker and no one to make your moves a lot sooner. Um, whereas in the 15, you kind of have a little bit more time to think, which is nice. Um, and so I guess I just kind of, it's almost like a long version of the eight, I guess you'd say is the 15. So you just kind of have to take it a little bit more slowly in your mind, even though it's still a fast race. It's just, um, very different in the way you look at it. And it's, I guess, I don't know if that answers your question or not. No, no, it does. Well, cause some people see, I mean, going, coming from a shorter distance background, it makes sense that you'd see mm-hmm. the 15 as a long eight, as opposed to yeah. a, short, a short 5k, which is how it's a yeah. very short 5k. Uh, I mean, what do you attribute, you know, this season's improvement to, it seems like you've made a, a couple big jumps throughout your career, you yeah. know, high school, 213, 800 runner, and you drop that time way down. Mm-hmm. How are you able to make these jumps? Well, I definitely have been a lot more consistent this year in my training, which has probably been the main reason why I've done so well this year. I just like haven't really gotten injured. And so I've been able to train all the way from cross country into indoor and outdoor track, which is something I don't think I've gotten to actually do before because I think I had small injuries before that have just taken me out for a week or two, but it makes a difference. And, um, I also have increased my mileage from high school cause I really wasn't running too many miles in high school, um, in my workouts or anything. So that what, would be what influence speed. did, uh, Hannah Green have on you? And after she's graduated, do you feel like you've had to step into more of a leadership role in the team? Yeah, definitely. She was a really big influence on me. I always saw her out in the workouts taking big steps. Um, I was usually right behind her, but she definitely had a bit more of a kick when I was a freshman and sophomore than I had. And so she would always be out in front and I would just always be trying to chase her down basically. So I kind of realized that now that she's gone, I kind of have to do that for myself and take over that role. And so I'm sure some of my teammates probably feel that way about me now that, um, (laughs) she's gone. Um, but yeah, no, she was a really good role model, and um, I was glad I got the chance to train with her. Seeing her join the um, OTC and going pro, does that make it seem like mm-hmm. something that might be possible for you after you graduate? Yeah, definitely. Um, I've been thinking about it. I'm not sure what I'll do yet, but it definitely makes it a lot more um, seem very doable, I guess, and like something I could do if I wanted to. Um, yeah. And I mean, you've spoken on this a little bit already, just the benefits of being able to be healthy all the way through the season, but, um, Mm -hmm. you've appeared at regionals pretty much every year, but, uh, Mm -hmm. this indoor season was the first time you made an NCAA final. What was your Mm -hmm. takeaway from that experience? Oh, it was huge to make it there. Um, in general, just to get to be around that kind of competition was something I, hadn't really experienced for the most part. I had gone to, um, junior, uh, yeah, USA junior nationals, um, my freshman year, which was still a pretty big stage, but, um, not quite the same as going to NCAAs. It's just a little bit different, um, because you're here with all the athletes that are really good instead of just certain ages. And it was kind of an honor just to get to run on a stage that I probably, or a lot of people probably won't get the chance to ever do. So it's pretty neat. How was that final race different from any other race you've been in? Oh, oh my gosh. Well, we went out in, I think, a 27 or 28 <laughs> in the first 200. So it was just way faster than I was expecting. Um, caught me off guard a little bit. And unfortunately, I got boxed in pretty quickly. And Normally I'm pretty good at getting out of boxes, but it just, I had a really hard time getting out of it that time. And unfortunately in the 800, like I said before, it's such a quick race that once you're kind of stuck, it takes your stride, it kind of messes it up a little bit and it just makes everything a little bit harder. So it was a very fast race. And is the plan to go for the 800, 1500 double at NCAA Outdoors? 
No. Um, I'll be in the 1500. I think the people entered just came out yesterday. Um, so yeah, I'll be in the 1500 and I'm excited for it. Nice. So the transition mm-hmm. is complete. <laughs> yeah, I guess you could say that. So how do you, how, Rachel, how do you approach that prelim meet where 12th is as good as first and the whole goal is just to advance and now you're only focusing on one event, but how do you strategize, mm-hmm. you know, getting through that meet and making sure as the top time in the NCAA that, that you mm-hmm. get to Eugene? Um, I think I will definitely have to see who all is in my heat and just kind of judge it based on that. But knowing that there's a little bit of leeway is definitely nice, but definitely doesn't mean I'm going to let up at all. Um, it just gives you a little bit more room for error. Not that I'm trying to make any errors, but, um, I guess it's just kind of nice to know. Um, cause I mean, obviously the goal is always to win your race, but technically, um, you don't have to just as long as you're top five in your heat, I believe is what it's going to be. Um, so it's kind of nice just knowing that, but also it still means I'm going to need to work hard. So do you do you put it in your head like, hey, I should just try to win my heat because it's just simpler that way, and that way you don't need to spend energy during the race, like counting people in front of you, especially. Yeah. I mean, if you're only running one race, I would guess that mm-hmm. that lessens your concerns a little bit about, oh, I don't want to overdo it in this one race, but I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, I definitely. I I think it's any runner's goal to win a race. I mean. And just, it's just always your goal, I think. Um, but I also just, yeah, it would probably make it easier. I hate having to count people in front of me when I'm trying to race also. So yeah, it definitely would make it easier. And we talked earlier about all the steps and the progression that you've taken in your career. What would the next, mm-hmm. the next step up for you, what would that look like? What would that be? Uh, as far as going pro, you mean? Well, in or... terms of time, place, like how are you judging the next oh. evolution of yourself? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, like I said before, I guess Hannah Green kind of set the goal for me already as far as doubling. So um, I guess just to keep improving and go for an even faster time next year in the 15 and the 8. Um and a higher place at nationals if possible. And with runners like mm-hmm. Hannah Green, I mean, I think she was second to Raven Rogers like four or five times. And the men, mm-hmm. women, the DMR at indoors this year. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that Vince Chiatti getting second in the mile. Um, there's been mm-hmm. a lot of great performances, but uh, a lot of the talk is kind of still about the Oregons or the USC's and, do you right. feel like Virginia Tech uh, is an underrated program? Yeah, definitely. I definitely think Virginia Tech should be considered one of the very elite teams, I would think, at this point, just based on the performances we've had. But um, I guess it's kind of nice to also be the underdog sometimes. So I'm not complaining with <laughs> the way people view us, I guess. <laughs> Um, kind of surprise them. And I know you went to Good Counsel for high school, and I'm actually from mm-hmm. Montgomery County. <laughs> oh, no way. Yeah, Wait, I really? went to Blair. Um, oh, that's funny. But I actually went oh. to the cross-country camp that Tom Arnold oh. used to put on. Coach Arnold? So, yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious oh my gosh. what your best Tom Arnold story is. <laughs> oh, jeez. Um. <laughs> huh. You might need a minute guess, to think about it. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> oh. Hmm. Well, I actually only ran with him for one year because um, I only did cross country one year in high school. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I probably don't have as many stories as you're expecting me to. Um, <laughs> but I guess maybe it was more in school was always what kind of got to me was that because he knew me, I guess I stood out in the crowds and stuff. And so we had uniforms, right. Um, that we had to wear because it was a private school. Yeah. And (laughs) 
we had skirts that we had to wear and I have such long legs, unfortunately, that my skirt always looked like it was really short and it never was. <laughs> and so <laughs> you only, you were supposed to have it a few inches above your knee, but no more than that. And most girls like rolled their skirts up really high and it was just what everyone did. But I always, since I knew I was under, um, the eyes of coach Arnold, I always was like, Nope, I gotta keep my skirt like pretty long. <laughs> and I just remember being in the um, lunchroom one day and walking by him and um, our other disciplinarian, and they just, they called me over, and they were like, Rachel, your skirt is too short. And I looked down, and I was like, it's not, it's really not. Um, (laughs) But, yeah, so I had to, like, try and make sure it looked a little bit longer and (laughs) didn't get, um... I guess under, I didn't get like taken under by him again like that because it was kind of embarrassing when all my friends, they had much shorter skirts and I was like, it's only because he knows me and my legs just look so long. <laughs> and so. for those who don't know, Coach Arnold was the, is the disciplinarian at Good Council in addition to being the cross country coach for 34 yeah. or so years. I think he retired mm-hmm. a couple of years ago. But yeah, he did. But yeah, no, he's a very good coach. Um, I always like enjoyed running for him. He definitely improved me as a runner um, and definitely challenged me a lot. Um, I had never done cross country before, like I had said, and it definitely made me think of distance running in a different way. Um, Kind of made it more doable, I guess, to see that I could make it through races and stuff. Um, He was definitely very tough on us as you probably know, but, um, definitely, um, worthwhile experience. I heard that he used to go around to the cross country kids in the lunchroom and make sure they had green stuff mm-hmm. on their plates. Is that oh, true? Yep. That was also, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> I think there was maybe one Friday where we didn't have a meet and I was like, okay, this is the one time I can have French fries. And <laughs> <laughs> so I picked up some French fries and he came over and he just called me out in front of the whole table of people oh I was God. sitting at. And he was like, Pokrapsky, what are you eating? <laughs> Gosh, darn it. <laughs> and that was last so. time Rachel had French fries. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, it was kind of funny too. So. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Uh, congrats yeah, again no on the big double at ACC's and can't wait to see what thank happens you. at prelims. Good luck. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks again to our guest, Rachel Prokratsky of Virginia Tech. In these last 10 minutes, JoJo, let's let's talk NCAA prelims. As you mentioned, both the East and West will be live on Flow Track, not this weekend, but next weekend. I'll be in Sacramento. We'll have a team out in Tampa. It'll go Thursday, Friday, Saturday. The goal being finish in that top 12. <laughs> <laughs> By any means necessary, finish in that in that top 12. Um, what were some things? when you comb through the entries that you found interesting? Uh, definitely the biggest one, I would say, is Carissa Schweizer. She is going for the 10K, 5K double. Uh, I mean, obviously things could change when she actually gets to prelims. Um, but for now, she is chasing a little bit of history. Uh, if she were to pull off the double at nationals, she'd be the fifth woman in NCAA history to do so, and the first since Dom Scott did it two years ago in 2016. Um, it's interesting because I feel like her biggest competition comes from the New Mexico women. Mm-hmm. And instead of doubling up, they're all focusing on one event. So in the 10K, she has Alice Wright to contend with. And I still think the 10K should be a fairly easy victory for her. Not easy, but she's 15 seconds ahead mm-hmm. of the field. Alice Wright is 15 seconds behind her. And she definitely has the best kick of any 10K runner. Uh, I think the 5K is going to be tough coming off the 10K right. two nights before. Uh, and she's got Edna Kurgat and Wayne Kalati, both of whom are going to be fresh and be mm. able to work together. Team tactics. Yeah, so it should, be, it should be interesting. It should be fun. I mean, she's won five NCAA titles uh, going for six and seven. Yeah. I had my eye, obviously, on the big name out east, Cindy McLaughlin, qualified in 100, 200, 400, <laughs> 400 hurdles, both relays. I have to admit, I thought she'd do the 400 and 400 hurdles just because I thought she could 
pull that off. She's three seconds clear. Is that right? Of the next best woman in the yeah, no one else has broken fifty six. I don't think. Yeah, in in the NCAA, well, the woman she beat and from LSU is the number two um, athlete in the nation this year, and you know she beat her by about three seconds when she just ran her fifty two seventy five. So. I thought she could do both, and I still think she probably could do both. However, she picked the foreign hurdles, and I, I guess I get it from the perspective of, well, number one, it'll be awesome because there'll be, like, legitimate world record, American record stakes on the For line. Sure. But also, she hasn't won a title yet, so I get that you want to make sure you get one title before you start piling on multiple challenges, <laughs> and 30 minutes between the 400 and foreign hurdles, maybe, I still think she would have been fine, but maybe it throws enough doubt into the equation where you're like, let's just not, let's not push it. Let's yeah. not overdo it. And also it's, she's raced so much this season. You don't want to overdo it, but I would love to watch a 400 race with her and Ellis and Irby. I at, never at thought she was going to do the 400 to be honest, because you're also forgetting. She's also, they're going to throw her in the four by one. She's going to be in the four by four, mm-hmm. maybe not do prelims for four by four. Cause they can probably qualify pretty easily. Right. But I mean, that's still, at most six races, mm-hmm. uh, you know, if she skips prelims for the relays, still four. Mm-hmm. Um, and then to add another two for the open four, which is going to be a tough race. Um, I just don't see Coach Flo doing that to her. Yeah. I just would have liked to see it. Just cause, I mean, it would be fun, yeah. Because it, it would be awesome competition in the four, whereas the hurdles, it's, I mean, three seconds clear of people in a 400 meter race is, I mean, it's a, it's a massive margin and it would mean the storyline will be whether or not she can set another personal best and how high she climbs on the all time list. So still plenty to get excited about and, and plenty to watch. But I mean, Alice just ran 49.99. Is that yeah. right? I mean, and certainly Sydney has the capability to go that fast. So it, it, it would have been a cool one to see. Um, are there any other takeaways so yeah Schweizer, uh, i mean michael norman like mm. sydney is you know good very good in a lot of events <laughs> and really he's the top ranked guy in the 200 the men's 200 is a little bit weaker than the men's 400 but he's opting to do the four and not the two which i thought was interesting mm-hmm. uh i mean he definitely could do both lena irby from georgia is doing both events mm-hmm. on the women's side um but he's just going to focus on that four which is awesome because that's going to be a really good race with the two Nathans, Nathan Allen, Nathan Strother, Strother who both ran 44-2, 44-3 at SECs. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's going to be a really, really fast race. World record holder indoors. I guess he wants to he wants to carry that mantle through to outdoors. But yeah, I'm with you. I, w- I would like to see him in both USC in the four by four as well too. So he'll be he'll be busy. Yeah, he'll be busy. Yeah, for sure. I don't know um, if that factored in, but. Yeah, I, I think we could see something crazy fast at NCAA's with all four of those guys. You know, Will London and then the two Nathans and yeah. Michael Norman uh, all together. Not to mention someone like Akeem Bloomfield from Auburn who didn't yeah, run Yeah, although well he, at didn't run, he didn't run. So I don't know if he's hurt. Oh, uh, okay. But he was someone who ran really fast indoors too. And if it wasn't right. for Norman running that fast, he would have been, oh, my gosh. So And also just as a sophomore as well. Um, and then you have Ali O on here as well. Looks like she's doubling up again. Yeah, she's doing the steeple 5K double again, just like last year. Um, that should be interesting because she's got more than 10 seconds on everyone else in the steeplechase right. field. Uh, the number two girl, Marie Bouchard, uh, who's run 941. So she's the only one who's close. Uh, she's running the 5K, not the steeple. Uh, which I thought was interesting because I feel like the 5K is going to be a lot tougher to place as high as a steeplechase. But, um, yeah, Ali O. Uh, I mean, last year she got first and fourth. Mm-hmm. So it be interesting to see what she does. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you got to – what schedule-wise, steeple and up front, right, and then the five at the end. So you, yeah, I mean, you, put your you best have a couple first. hours. Yeah. Put your best event first. I guess it's a little more advantageous. That's why I kind of, I thought Norman might go for it too, because because yeah. the you know, the four the event he wants to kind of re- retain his dominance over, and then you run the two for, for you know with house money. But then I guess the four too, and then the the four by four. But yeah, plenty plenty here to to dig into. Um, and before we get to that, obviously they got to get top twelve at prelims, which you right. guys can watch uh, May twenty fourth to twenty sixth. So that's 
Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then the fields will be set. No waiting around. 12 from each. <laughs> they go to Eugene. It's very cut and dry. It's very, very simplistic. I mean, 48 down to 12, and then 12 from each reason down to 24. And, and, and away we go. So, Yeah, so tune in. Uh, you know, we're a week out about a week out from the prelims right now. So stay tuned to the site for more previews, top takes. Um, all sorts yeah. of stuff. We got it all. Flashbacks. <laughs> Reliving Fred Curley's 43-7? Yeah. Fred Curley ran a 43-7 at the prelims? Wow. He did. It was crazy. I wonder if someone else is going to do it this week. Oh, yeah, and thanks to our guest, uh, Rachel Prokatsky, for joining us this episode. We appreciate her time. Um, yeah, like JoJo said, tune into the site. More stuff coming as we ramp up into the NCAA prelims and 